Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing uh, support of the CG Signature Lecture Series, and also tonight's co-sponsor, the Balsley School of International Affairs, for their support. Thanks also to those joining us from around the world through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, uh, we welcome questions from both audiences here in the CG Auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. In this era of technology, discovery and innovation, the role of science and scientists has never been more important. And so the demand for scientific advice is growing. Questions are put to scientists from policymakers, the media, and the public on issues ranging from climate change to cybersecurity, from poverty to pandemics. But the experts themselves are also coming under a microscope from wider society, leading to tensions and dilemmas in the governance of science. To address these issues tonight, we have Dr. James Wilsden. And to more properly introduce Professor Wilson, I'd now like to call on Heather Douglas, the Waterloo Chair in Science and Society in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Waterloo. So uh, first I'd like to thank CG for uh, sponsoring this public lecture this evening, um, as well as the Balsley School for helping to sponsor the workshop that's conjoined with it, the Science Policy Interface International Comparisons, taking over the last today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow at the Balsley School, which has been funded both by the Balsley School, the University of Waterloo, and the Social, Social, Science, uh, uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, but uh, my great pleasure is actually to introduce James Wilsden uh, for this evening's lecture. Professor Wilsden is currently Professor of Science and Democracy at the Science and Technology Policy Research Centre, which is also famously known as SPRU, at the University of Sussex. Prior to joining SPRU, he was Director of the Science Policy Centre of the Royal Society from 2008 to 2011, and he also worked at the Think Tank Demos from 2001 to 2008, first as Head of Strategy, and then as Head of Science and Innovation. He earned his PhD at Middlesex University in 2004, and has subsequently published widely on science policy issues in both the UK and in other countries, particularly in Asia. He has published numerous articles and reports, including co-editing the 2013 Future Directions for Scientific Advice in Whitehall. He is a member of the expert panel convened for the Council of Canadian Academies' forthcoming report on the state of, science, state of Canada's science culture. And he is co-founder and editor of The Guardian's blog on science policy, which I recommend that you take a look at. On third, uh, and tonight, he will be ex uh, giving this lecture on science, technology, and experiments in democracy, which will explore opportunities, tensions, and dilemmas in the democratic governance of science and technology. Please welcome James Wilson. Great. Well, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Fred, for that uh, introduction. And uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've heard a lot about uh, CG over the last few years. Um, uh, so it's a real pleasure to have an opportunity to come and, uh, uh, and see where it all happens. Um, as Heather says, um, I'm here as part of a bigger group, many of whom are here in the audience, uh, who've been looking uh, over the last couple of days and tomorrow uh, at science policy interactions in Canada, the US, uh, and the UK. Uh, and throughout our discussions, we've been considering uh, democracy uh, as a crucial, if at times complicated, part uh, of that mix. And this evening, um, given that polls have just in the last few hours closed um, on the first day of the European Parliament elections back uh, uh, at home for me, uh, I thought I'd widen that lens a little further to uh, explore with you the relationship between science and democracy in Europe. Uh, and I want to start with two contrasting faces of European democracy. <laughs> One on the left is Conchita Verst, the Austrian chanteurs who won the heart of millions when she stormed to victory two weeks ago in the Eurovision Song Contest with her Shirley Bassey-style anthem, Rise Like a Phoenix. Um, the other, uh, it's fairly obvious who, is Nigel Farage, uh, leader of the far-right UK Independence Party, uh, who most pollsters predict will have won the largest share of the public vote uh, in the UK today in, in, in the European elections. 
One represents creativity, experimentation and diversity. Uh, Conchita is in many ways an ambassador for a progressive cosmopolitan vision of Europe. The other represents xenophobia, cultural pessimism uh, and the politics of fear, a retreat back into a little England view of the world that had precious little to offer us uh, in the 1950s and even less today. And at a time when uh, the project of um, European integration has been stalling in the aftermath of the financial crisis, when we see the rise of populist extremist voices in many member states, uh, and when there's a crisis of confidence in democracy, not only in Europe, uh, but arguably worldwide, um, I want, in, in my remarks this evening, to mount a defence, uh, however unfashionable, uh, of democratic engagement and deliberation as, as an imperfect but vital uh, and, I think, consistently undervalued asset uh, of European science and innovation. And I hope that the arguments I make, um, while rooted in the European context, has, have resonance uh, and relevance to the Canadian context too. What's gone wrong with democracy is a question we've been hearing a lot recently. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, will have read this um, provocative cover essay in The Economist a few weeks ago, it came out in, in March, which took recent events in Ukraine uh, as the prompt for a lament about the prospects for democracy worldwide. Uh, and as The Economist argues in that piece, uh, the quote there, democracy is going through a difficult time uh, where autocrats have been driven out of office, their opponents have mostly failed to create viable democratic regimes, even in established democracies, flaws in the system have become worryingly visible and disillusion with politics is rife. Yet just a few years ago, democracy looked uh, as though it would dominate the world. Uh, and the Economist piece mentions work by the U uh, US think tank Freedom House, which uh, in the year 2000 classified 120 countries uh, as democracy. They now, however, suggest that 2013 was the eighth consecutive year in which global freedom on various indices has declined. Uh, and as we've seen in various different ways in Cairo, in Crimea, uh, or in South Sudan, faith in democracy flares up in moments of triumph and transition uh, only to collapse again all too quickly. Linked to the argument in that economist piece, I want to mention this book uh, which came out a few months ago, uh, written by uh, a guy called David Runciman, who's Professor of Politics uh, at Cambridge uh, in the UK. Um, and it, it's a great book, it makes one of the best um, attempts, I've read at least, to grapple with the dilemmas of contemporary democracy. Um, he starts his book, The Confidence Trap, by telling two competing stories about democracy. One is the obvious success story. Over the past hundred years, democracies have shown that they can win wars, recover from economic crises, overcome environmental challenges, uh, and consistently outperform their rivals. Their progress, of course, hasn't been entirely smooth or consistent, but there can be little doubt that democracy was the overall winner uh, of the 20th century, to the point where it was possible to argue, as Francis Fuk Fukuyama famously did in the early 90s, uh, that liberal democracy is the only plausible answer to the fundamental problems of human history. But alongside this story of success, as Runciman explains, there's another to be told, one of pessimism uh, and fear. No matter how successful in practice, democracies have always been full of people worried that things are about to go wrong, that the system's in crisis, and that its rivals are waiting to pounce. The onward march of democracy has been accompanied by a constant drumbeat of intellectual anxiety and a preoccupation with the prospect of failure. So while there's still plenty of optimism around, whenever we see autocratic governments overthrown or when countries seem about to slot neatly into that Fukuyama end of history arc, uh, as The Economist uh, article argues, there are also plenty of good reasons for Democrats to feel rather gloomy. And a further source of that anxiety is the performance of the world's established democracies, many of which are now heavily in debt, have spent the past decade fighting long and difficult wars, seem incapable now of doing anything meaningful about long-term global challenges like climate change, and are watching with a mixture of resignation and fear the seemingly inexorable rise of China. So as, as David Runciman describes it, we're confronted with a puzzle Recent history suggests that democracies can cope with whatever's thrown at them, yet the most successful democracies are currently struggling to cope. 
But he goes on to argue that we have to see how these two stories about democracy, in fact, go hand in hand. The mistake is to think that the news about democracy must be either good or bad. Instead, good news and bad news feed off each other. This is the democratic condition. It means that the triumph of democracy isn't an illusion, but neither is it a panacea. It's a trap, and this is the confidence trap that he's talking about in the title of the book. The factors that make democracy work successfully over time, its flexibility, its variety, its responsiveness, are the very same factors that cause democracies to go wrong. They produce impulsiveness and short-termism and historical myopia. The successes of democracy over the past 100 years haven't resulted in more mature, far-sighted and self-aware democratic societies. So democracy's triumphed, but it hasn't grown up. Democratic politics is as childish and petulant as it's ever been. We squabble, we moan, we despair. Uh, and as his quote here I put up on the slide says, uh, democracies stumble their way through crisis, groping for a way out. Yet it's this capacity to stumble through crises that gives democracy the edge over its autocratic rivals. Democracies are better at surviving crises than any alternative system because they can adapt. They keep groping for a solution even as they keep making mistakes. And it's here that I want to link my argument back to science and innovation because, of course, the very virtues that uh, Runciman describes that make democracy work are also those that make science work. Uh, a commitment to reason and transparency, an openness to critical challenge, a scepticism towards claims that too neatly support dominant assumptions, a willingness to listen to countervailing arguments, uh, a readiness to admit uncertainty and ignorance, uh, and a respect for evidence. And I want to mention another scholar here in this slide who I think has done more than most to illuminate this relationship uh, between science and democracy, and that's Sheila Jasanoff, who's based at Harvard. In her most recent book um, up here, Science and Public Reason, Sheila Jasanoff reminds us that for all practical purposes, uh, the birth of experimental science coincided with the rise of democratic accountability in politics. And in strengthening democratic values today, uh, we also renew the preconditions for scientific discovery uh, and technological innovations. But the connections between the two, between science, democracy, and innovation, are complicated uh, and at times contested. If we look back to the end of the 19th century, Western intellectuals saw the world as progressing neatly from superstition and ignorance towards knowledge and reason. Science led the way revealing indisputable facts about the natural world and our place in it. Scientific ways of knowing went hand in hand with the rise of modern nation states, uh, and advances in science and technology made our lives easier, healthier, and more productive. But this optimistic alliance between science, technology, and democracy proved rather short-lived. Two world wars, repeated genocidal conflicts, entrenched poverty, environmental degradation, uh, and from 1945 onwards, the uh, pervasive fear of nuclear annihilation meant that more science could no longer uh, in and of itself be relied upon straightforwardly to deliver improved qualities of quality of life. The same knowledge could be directed towards good and evil uses and as a result how to direct it towards beneficial ends became an increasing preoccupation of post-war societies. The expectations that states had for science and technology no longer mapped neatly and inevitably onto the visions that citizens held for themselves. Knowledge became, in a sense, its own undoing. A vast penumbra of what we don't know and can't presume to control grew along science's moving frontiers. Scientific research could no longer be counted upon to provide an expanding array of reliable, policy-relevant facts, and technologies in operation proved far more unruly, error-prone, and less predictable than the optimists have proclaimed. Things went wrong, sometimes on catastrophic scales, from computer system crashes to global financial meltdowns to industrial disasters and climate change. Uh, and as Jasanoff describes, the nuclear accident at Japan's Fukushima power plant in March 2011 carried all the trademarks uh, of human overreaching. In a nation's school to accept the state's expert assurances, an earthquake of unexpected severity set loose a tsunami of epic proportions, overwhelming and aging and ill-maintained plants, inadequate fail-safe mechanisms. Uh, and the inevitable co questions quickly surfaced. Who was at fault? Who should have known? Who should be compensated? And who held responsible? A common response to such crises is one of denial. Uh, 
Accidents and disasters are often written off as unintended consequences of well-intentioned choices. No one, so this story goes, could reasonably have foretold that rising fossil fuel use would lead to climate change, or that disease-preventing chemicals would give rise to viral resistance, that explosives would be commandeered by terrorists turning their bodies into living bombs, or that electronic networks would enable unprecedented levels of state surveillance. Defining such failures as unintended tacitly absolves science and technology and its human architects of responsibility and blame. The benefits of technology can be seen and known. They're real, reliable, calculable. Harms, by contrast, are exceptional, unpredictable, and recognizable only after the fact. Another common response alongside denial is to seek refuge in rational calculation. Futures perhaps can't be completely known, but they can be managed using the increasingly powerful methods of risk assessment, cost-benefit analysis, and evidence-based policy. These are topics that we've been discussing at this conference the last couple of days. And those methods neatly divide the challenge of governing the future into a scientific and notionally apolitical realm of assessment and prediction, uh, leaving to one side an entirely separate realm of political values and responses. Both responses are, are inadequate denial uh, and rational calculation. And as we've seen on issues ranging from nuclear power to GM crops, fracking to animal testing, they've repeatedly given rise to more vocal and visceral forms uh, of public protest. Whether you see these as examples of Luddite uh, excess or uh, of uninvited public participation, at the very least they do, uh, as Jasanoff argues, signal a need for new forms uh, of public participation. And it's this, of course, that's been the prevailing mood in uh, European science policy uh, over the past 10 or 20 years. By and large, we've seen a rhetorical shift away from a deficit model of scientists talking down to the public and telling them to embrace uncritically the benefits of new technologies towards a more conversational mode uh, of dialogue and deliberation. Uh, in the UK context, this was well summed up by an influential House of Lords report in the year 2000. Uh, and several of the participants at this conference uh, here over the last uh, couple of days, people like Alan Irwin, uh, Dave Guston, Kevin Jones, have both contributed to and helped to chart the contours of this shift uh, in Europe and the US. Ten years ago, I was heavily involved in researching and advocating for uh, new forms of public engagement in science through a series of projects that uh, we ran at the UK think tank Demos. Uh, these are just two examples. Um, and over the past decade, uh, in the UK and across most of Europe, we've seen a flowering of policies, initiatives, and practical experiments designed to stimulate and support more open, deliberative, and accountable modes of science and innovation policymaking. More recently, at the start of this year, uh, I and a couple of colleagues edited a special issue of, of this journal, Public Understanding of Science, which brought together several uh, leading thinkers in this field to try and make sense of what we learned from the past 20 years of theory, policy, and practice. The articles uh, in that issue reflect in, in various thoughtful ways on the progress that we've seen, but they also highlight plenty of failures and limitations. Public engagement in science and technology was originally motivated by this ends-based debate about the governance uh, and political legitimacy of science and technology. But too often, these questions about ends have been overshadowed by a focus on the means and processes uh, of engagement, the methods through which engagement takes place. Uh, and dialogue, rather than prompting scientific institutions and scientific policymakers to open up and ask deeper questions about values, about choices and purposes, uh, can be used instead far too often as a convenient method uh, of extracting particular opinions uh, and using those to close down debates. As Alan Irwin says in his essay in this, uh, in this issue, we need to ask ourselves if, uh, in respect of public engagement in science, we're moving forward uh, or we're moving in circles. Reflecting on his 20 years or more of involvement in these, these debates, he suggests, I'm now less inclined to think in terms of from and to, so the kind of slides that I use there, um, and more likely to view scientific governance, including the particular issue of public engagement with science, as an often messy and contradictory business where dilemmas and paradoxes abound. And it seems to me that this account of the dynamics uh, of science and democracy 
fits very well alongside the broader defense of democracy as a political system that's being offered by thinkers like David Runciman. Because, of course, we see that meta-level crisis of confidence in democracy ricocheting and rebounding into science and innovation policy uh, in various ways, given added force by the economics of austerity uh, in Europe and elsewhere. We see it in narratives which link the seemingly inexorable rise of China as a scientific and technological power to its absence of formal structures for democracy. Ruled by engineers and unconstrained by electoral cycles and the need for public consultation, so we're told China is able to forge ahead. Of course, this is a gross simplification and misrepresentation of the far messier political realities on the ground in China. Meanwhile, we see fresh efforts to argue that the refusal of European citizens to welcome every single scientific and technological advance will see us being left behind uh, in a notional global race which runs at one speed down a single track, rather than branching into multiple pathways, each shaped by a distinctive set of technological, social and political choices. So at a time like this, I think we need to hold our nerve. We need to keep investing in efforts, however uh, imperfect they may be, to build public dialogue and deliberation into the governance of science and technology. Uh, the UK ScienceWise program uh, up here is just one example. Uh, that's an effort that's been running for 10 years now in the UK to uh, run public dialogues around uh, particular issues, usually controversial issues, uh, attached to uh, frontier areas of science and new technologies. Uh, and it's just one example. There are many such programs across uh, Europe and elsewhere. We need to throw our weight uh, and support behind emerging policy agendas, uh, such as that around this idea of responsible research and innovation, uh, which has become the new uh, frame, the new buzzword through which uh, the European Commission um, and its uh, 80 billion euro program of research under Horizon 2020 uh, has become the frame through which it approaches issues uh, that would previously have been described in terms of science and society. Responsible innovation builds on uh, many of these earlier approaches and all of these lessons over the past couple of decades in and around public engagement, technology assessment, and anticipatory governments. Uh, and it's also a growing focus of scholarly work in STS, in, in science technology studies and related fields, uh, not least through this journal, uh, which I thought I should plug because its editor, Dave Guston, is here uh, with us as well in the, uh, this conference. So responsible innovation is another uh, way in which we can move things forward. I think we need to give our support to individuals like this. This is Anne Glover, who uh, in 2012 was appointed as the first ever chief scientific advisor to the European Commission, uh, supporting the president of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, uh, and trying in part to improve processes of evidence-based policy at the top tier of European policymaking. Uh, but I think, importantly, uh, the role of someone like uh, a chief scientific advisor in this context, Anne Glover, I think, has risen uh, to this challenge, is not only to sort of reflect the value of science and evidence-based approaches uh, towards European publics and European audiences, but also to bring the voice and views uh, of citizens and publics back into the policy process. Uh, and there are various methods and tools through which that can be done. Um, but having someone in that role, having someone there as a chief scientific advisor, again, as we've been discussing uh, at this meeting, uh, is a positive uh, route towards some of these approaches. I think we need to uh, applaud and work with the grain of the shift that we're seeing within scientific communities to a greater focus on openness. We've seen a lot of debate in the last couple of years around uh, open access in scientific publishing, making sure that journal articles are readily available to uh, uh, public audiences. Now, of course, you know, making stuff open online isn't necessarily going to change the dynamics uh, and accountabilities of science and technology, uh, but it's still a start uh, and it's a step in the right direction. Um, and there are related debates around open data uh, and around other forms of open science that really do seem to have um, captured the imagination and enthusiasm of a very broad cross-section of the scientific community. These start from slightly different places to, to debates around public engagement, but they have a lot in common, and I think far more could be done uh, for the communities involved in both of those debates to forge a uh, common cause uh, in pursuit of more open, uh, accountable modes of, of, of doing science. 
I think there's a lot that can be done to build on uh, the opportunities of social media uh, as a new, or as multiple new platforms through which um, ordinary citizens, members of the public can engage with scientists, with science policymakers, uh, and take part in debates about the future of science and technology. Uh, we see lots of examples of ways in which this is, been, this is being done. Just this week, in fact, it's happening to what's well, happened tonight on, on British television. Uh, uh, a big um, innovation think tank in the UK called Nesta has teamed up with the BBC uh, to launch a modern version of the Longitude Prize that was uh, first run 300 years ago. Uh, and uh, in doing so has sought to elicit the views of a broad cross-section of, of the British public uh, as to uh, particular scientific research challenges that should be set uh, and to which uh, up to £10 million should be allocated. Now, I mean, £10 million is small beer in the context of a big uh, a science and innovation system. Um, but it's an effort, at least, to try and uh, align research in a modest way with uh, public concerns, public values, public preferences. And again, I think it's the kind of thing we should build on uh, and applaud. Um, and I think we should also remain open to uh, what some scholars working in this, in this area would call uninvited public engagement, public protest, things like this. This is uh, uh, Brian May from Queen, uh, who's been one of the uh, figureheads of a, a protest movement in the UK against the culling uh, of badgers, which has been linked to uh, bovine TB. Uh, but it's just one of many examples of, of uh, uh, um, bottom-up, uh, at times inconvenient, often vocal and noisy uh, protest movements that have arisen around particular uh, developments in science and technology, but which must be seen as well as uh, legitimate forms of public uh, engagement. So to finish where I started with the uh, uh, beautiful and talented Conchita Verst, my argument in essence is that for all its imperfections, those countries which see democracy as a vital asset of their science and innovation systems and continue to experiment with dialogue, deliberation and public engagement are the ones most likely to rise like a phoenix uh, and succeed over the long term. Thanks very much. Great. So I think there's time now for questions. So I'm told that questions can appear on the screen from the internet uh, or indeed by, uh, from any of you. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please come forward. I think there's a couple of roving mics. Uh, um, and we've got already, I think, some awesome points coming in here on the screen. Denial nor rationalisation are adequate for science-based policy, says Daniel J. Lewis. Um, but would anyone like to ask a question? Um, I mean, what I've tried to do there is just obviously link um, taking the European elections as, an, as, a, as, a, as a hook, uh, these debates uh, in Europe. Um, but of course, many of the same dynamics are present here in the Canadian system. As, as Heather mentioned in her introduction, I've been sitting on uh, a panel um, organised by the Council of Canadian Academies looking at Canada's science culture uh, the place of science in, in, in Canadian culture, which will be reporting, uh, I think, in August. Uh, and that's been a very interesting opportunity to sort of see how some of these debates are playing out here. Um, yes. David. James, thank you for uh, an interesting and uh, uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on your proposal uh, with regard to the European Science Advisor. It seems to me to put an awful lot on that office to not only represent uh, the facts, so to speak, and perhaps uh, from some people's point of view, the preferences of the scientific and technical community, but also to require that office to represent, in a sense, the public deliberation process as well. And uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you expect from that office and reflect as to whether that might be a little bit too much to put on um, one person who's going to have an awful lot of other stuff to do. Yes, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a new office, so, so there has never been uh, until 2012 a, a chief scientific advisor in, uh, in the European Commission. Um, it's a model, of course, that we have in the UK, that the, the US has and, and various other countries have. 
Um, and, and it's still um, finding its feet, I think, as a, as a role. I was actually over in Brussels uh, at the end of last week with Anne Glover, among others, talking about the possible structure of scientific advice under the new European Commission, which will be put in place um, after the Parliament elections, which are taking place this week. Um, and that role is in the gift of the President of the European Commission. It's not a, a given that it will even be renewed. Um, so there are big challenges in uh, even uh, maintaining the role, let alone, as you say, uh, um, adding to the to-do list of that individual all of these additional responsibilities. But I think it links to some of the arguments we were having in the, in the meeting yesterday um, about the mode in which um, scientific advice is, is, is carried out. Um, if uh, the role of uh, a good scientific advisor is not simply to be an expert in his and her right, but is to um, act as a broker, as an intermediary, as a translator of uh, um, scientific evidence, scientific perspectives into the policy process. Uh, I think it is also incumbent on those advisors to reflect the complexity and plurality of many of these debates. So it's that relationship between facts and values um, evidence from a variety of sources, including uh, uh, um, as it's reflected through public views, public concerns that need to be fed into the process. Uh, the office in itself can't do all of that on its own. It's a very small office. It's, it's not very well resourced. Um, but it's good to have someone at the very top of the system who not only is standing up for um, high quality, robust um, evidence uh, to inform policy, but is also reflecting uh, to policymakers on the uh, conditionality of that evidence and its role in policy and the need to bring alongside evidence uh, these other uh, perspectives and, and sources of input to the system. So that's the kind of role I would envisage um, Anne Glover's successor playing. During the introduction lecture, sir, you... <coughs> You mentioned that the democracy make mistake. Is it mistake or catastrophe? Number Sorry, one. I can't say that. Could is it say? mistakes or catastrophe in terms of a human being and environment, this democracy you're talking about? You mean on things like climate change? You... Pardon? When I read in your introduction that democracy make mistakes, and this mistake, do you think is a mistake or catastrophe for the human nature in terms of, of a human, in terms of environment? And then the democracy you speak about is that expenses of the military democracy, you, you think that it is suitable for the time being for the, or engagement with the, in this case with the United Nations maybe is better than individuals as democracy? Yes, I mean, I suppose what I was trying to reflect is that, that you know, there is an inevitable messiness and imperfection to democracy, but the, the argument in, in something like the David Runciman book that I mentioned is that we shouldn't, I mean, we should be worried, of course, uh, about that as we see it happening, but also recognise the inevitability of, of, of that messiness and of that imperfection. Uh, and, of course, climate change and, and environmental uh, challenges are, are an area where we see those tensions writ large. Um, uh, the question, of course, is, is whether uh, more authoritarian governance approaches are, are, are any better equipped to navigate us through uh, those kind of complex societal challenges. And I think um, uh, for all of the, the difficulties we face at times in, in reconciling these different competing tensions in democratic systems, uh, it's still, as the saying goes, uh, uh, you know, the worst system except for all the others. Yes, hi. Hi there. During your talk, you touched on the idea of responsible innovation. And I wondered if you might be able to speak to that a little bit further, elaborate on what that means and how it manifests. Yeah, sure. If I switch back. So, I mean, the... The, the term responsible research and innovation is essentially uh, um, a new way of talking about some quite familiar questions that we've been um, grappling with in various ways for a long time about um, uh, the um, 
relationship between science and innovation and wider society, its accountability, uh, the structures and modes of governance that surround it. Um, what's made it particularly uh, interesting right now is that it's a term that various uh, important players in the um, science policy, science funding system have seized upon uh, as the way in which to talk about these issues. And, and the European Commission is sort of first and foremost among those, as, as I was saying. Um, the European Commission runs very substantial um, research funding programs. Uh, Horizon 2020 will be around 80 billion euros uh, over the next seven years. Um, so they're a big player in most um, European funding systems. In the UK, uh, our public uh, budget, um, the, the government spending on, on research every year, amounts to about £5 billion. Pounds, uh, and Europe's contribution on top of that uh, is in the order of about another billion. So it's, it's something like 20% on top of, of what we spend uh, um, you know, from our own national budget. Um, so responsible research and innovation uh, is um, a topic that's uh, attracted a lot more attention from the policy audience and, as I say, from uh, people in the academic community who are concerned about these sorts of issues. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is one example of a report that's been written in Europe to try and sort of explain what it is, how it works. But, you know, it, its uh, relevance to this debate is that it's, it's a new framing that's being used um, uh, quite widely to try and open up and explore these kind of debates at the boundaries between science, technology and society. Oh, we've got a question in on the screen here, which I'm, I'll read out and answer. How much energy do and should scientific researchers put into educating elected policymakers in government on their research? Um, let's come up. So, yeah, I mean, this is something we've been talking about, again, uh, at, this, at this meeting, looking at scientific advice. Um, and I think um, in most uh, systems we see... Uh, um, you know, a, a plurality of different ways in which scientific researchers can engage with policymakers. Scientific advisors are one example of that. Uh, there are lots of other uh, structures and, and ways in which scientists can make their voices heard in the policy process. Um, I used to work at the Royal Society in London, which is the UK's National Academy, uh, and National Academies are one um, institutional vehicle through which scientific expertise and evidence uh, is often directed at the policy process. Um, but to take one of my final points about sort of social media and the, and the, the wider aspect of the debate, I think certainly um, for me, if I look at the science policy landscape now and compare it to five or ten years ago, one of the most striking differences is the um, proliferation of different uh, um, arenas in which these kind of debates are taking place. So, uh, if, you know, if we think about uh, the mainstream media, whereas um, 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to get uh, an argument into the comment pages of the newspaper, you had to uh, you know, persuade a comment editor on a, on a big newspaper to run your article. We now have so many different um, outlets for um, academics and others with opinions to uh, write and express those views in ways that uh, uh, can reach both policy and public audiences. I'm, I'm part, as, as Heather said in the introduction, of a team that blogs on science policy for the Guardian newspaper in the UK. And it's unheard of to think of, of you know, a newspaper having a dedicated space for discussion of these kind of, you know, quite at times technical debates about science policy. They certainly wouldn't have it in the main pages of the newspaper. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the space, the opportunity created by online media of various forms means that you've got much more texture, much more depth uh, 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 to, to this kind of coverage. Um, there are, of course, countervailing forces in, in the mainstream media as well. But, uh, uh, but I think, you know, there's lots of opportunities and uh, we clearly need to uh, encourage researchers, uh, scientists or social scientists to uh, take those responsibilities seriously. Yeah. Wait. This is actually a segue to that question that was on the web just now. Uh, my sense is that you're talking about the fact that democracy would be a catalyst for scientific innovation. And 
at a presentation I was at on climate change, this researcher said that he did a presentation to Canadian policy, uh, major policymakers in Ottawa, uh, that said that there was a requirement for long-term intervention to deal with climate change. And the basic message he had back was, if we would not see any impact within four years, we wouldn't buy into it which is the danger of elected officials making decisions about long-term scientific research. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Yes, I mean, again, the question I'd ask, well, what's the, what's the alternative uh, that, you're, that you'd propose to uh, 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 those elected officials? Um, uh, and this is the difficulty, of course, that we uh, face when we contemplate alternative systems. I mean, I think, you know, China, of course, as I mentioned, is, is frequently pointed to in this context. I, I do a fair bit of work on science and innovation policy in China. Lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time there over the last decade looking at these things. And I mean, you know, one very obvious facet of, of, of spending time in China or talking about these issues with uh, Chinese colleagues is that you realise, even in a system like uh, the Chinese system, with, of course, in one sense, an absence of formal... Um, representative democracy uh, and, and, and you know a single party system there's still a huge amount of debate and contestation within that system there's a lot of modes and forms of consultation uh, now they may not involve everybody they certainly don't and there's lots of ways in which we can criticize and should criticize um, uh, the absence of uh, various forms of political freedom and human rights within the Chinese system but it's certainly also wrong to pretend that uh, the direction of Chinese policy is being set uh, by a small group in a very controlled way without uh, some attempt to uh, navigate uh, uh, and, and grapple with competing values and demands uh, from wider society. Um, the huge problems there have been in recent years with air quality in several of China's larger cities, Beijing uh, among them, uh, have... Uh, been just one of the ways in which a much larger public has been uh, mobilised and in various ways politicised uh, to concern, you know, be more concerned about uh, um, issues of, of uh, environmental quality, health uh, and, and related global issues like climate change. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's messy, it's difficult, but uh, uh, as I say, um, uh, what's the alternative? Shall I take one again from the screen here? Um, so, uh, with increased public engagement, how can we ensure the public is adequately educated on the value of seemingly esoteric but essential areas of research? Is it desirable to have this level of engagement or should science govern its own goals? This is a question from Daniel J. Lewis. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is difficult. The, 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 We've seen in, in research, policy research funding uh, in, in Europe, I'm sure the same is here, in fact I know the same is here, also true in, in Canada, um, uh, a much greater focus on uh, encouraging researchers, scientists to articulate um, and spell out in various ways the uh, so-called impact of their research, the contribution that it will make to uh, the economy, to society, to public policy in various ways. Um, and that's something that at various points the scientific community uh, has resisted and continues to resist. Um, uh, there's always a, a, a pushback uh, against efforts to, uh, that seem in any way to sort of restrict and, and, and constrain uh, academic freedoms, which are, which are hard won and, and highly prized. Um, but I certainly think that while it's at times absurd and, and, and not necessarily productive to uh, expect researchers to predict in any deterministic way what the uh, longer term outcomes of their research might be 5, 10, 25, 50 years ahead, uh, which of course is, is almost impossible to know, it is good for the policy system, for the funding system to encourage researchers uh, at the point at which they either apply for money or are being assessed uh, 
uh, as to the quality of their research um, retrospectively to encourage them to think about uh, the kind of ways that research does, can, should connect to broader social agendas. Um, so I would be uh, in favour, to answer the question, of those forms of engagement uh, and a bit suspicious of uh, calls for science uh, to govern its own goals because uh, there's always a lot of politics at play uh, within that, uh, those forms of self-government, just as there are uh, in more transparent and accountable uh, pressures on, on the management of research. So I might, I hoped I might ask you a question um, uh, about the, your talk and tie it into some of the things we were talking about yesterday. So you opened your talk with a discussion of the, the value of democracy in part to be adaptable and flexible in the, chase, in the face of pressures and change. And clearly when you have an area like science and technology that will be rapidly changing, you need to have that. But we also talked yesterday about the problems of um, actually maintaining some kind of stability, especially in institutional structures across, say, elected governments so that you can have an institutional home for these kinds of processes and practices. And I wonder if you might comment on the tensions between uh, the need for stability and the need for flexibility at the science policy interface in democracies. Yes. Um, I mean, this is, of course, something that came up yesterday. And it, it, it partly is a contrast between the British and Canadian systems. I think there's a, a, a general sense in which the UK, the sort of institutional arrangements that the UK has in place to govern uh, science and, and technology policy have been more stable. They've existed over time. I say I, I work for the Royal Society, which uh, in 2010, while I was there, celebrated its 350th anniversary. So, you know, there's a certain sort of solidity to institutions that have been around that long. Um, uh, and, and, and that does have a, 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 you know, a positive effect in, in many respects in uh, ensuring that within the broader political system uh, there's a sort of well-recognized, well-established um, niche and role for, uh, in that particular case, the voice of uh, a body like a National Academy. Um, but I think, as well as I was trying to say in my, in my remarks, there's... Um, a huge value as well that comes from continuing to experiment with those structures and continuing to do other things around the edges. And if we think about public engagement, uh, most of what has happened in and around uh, those sorts of debates has been led by new organisations, you know, some set up with government money, but many uh, much more uh, um, bottom-up that have sort of sprung up in response to particular issues. Uh, and that has at times caught the uh, scientific uh, uh, establishment, longer established institutions on the hop. Uh, and I think that's generally a, a, a very good thing. Um, the other example I gave of the Longitude Prize, which has just been launched this, this week in, in the UK, uh, has been led by uh, an organization called Nesta, which uh, was only set up in the late 1990s. So again, is a very new, um, organization in the, in, the, in the context of the UK system. Uh, so as ever, you need a, a, a bit of both. Um, I think what is worrying at times about the Canadian system from our discussions yesterday is, is that the, the long list of good organizations that at various points have come into being but have uh, all too quickly and all too uh, uh, you know, rapidly been uh, uh, abolished or scrapped or, or uh, uninvented for various uh, expedient political reasons. And that's often... Uh, 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 you know, a recipe for um, memory loss institutionally within the system, which I think is a problem. Yes. Uh, James, uh, wonderful, thoughtful presentation. Uh, I have framed this question this way, and it might not be fair. So let's accept the primacy of Parliament as the will of the people, and we're not going to dispute that. Uh, and now we have emergent scientific consensus, let's call it, whether it's on the question of, of climate or GMO or name another, another issue. Uh, is that the fair place where we say, and, and, and Parliament accepts that view and then action has to be taken, decisions made on the basis of the scientific evidence that's, let's call it firm, uh, that now we can ignore 
the noisy crowds and the naysayers and the dissenters and and those folks are of course always going to be present in any democratic society. What are your thoughts on that? Well, of course, I mean, you know, the, that, that tension is ever present. And I know, I mean, I suppose what I'm arguing is, is not to ignore them because very often the uh, perspectives and, and uh, uh, values and views that they're bringing uh, to the surface has something to offer to, to the policy process. Uh, you know, it's understandable that scientists at times get impatient when they feel they have to go over and over again, you know, what feels to many of them like uh, very solid and familiar ground, whether that's, you know, over the health risks of, of genetically modified crops or, or uh, arguments around um, climate change. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the important thing to do is to be able to tap into dimensions of concern that uh, you know, illuminate aspects of those problems and potential aspects of the solutions uh, that uh, you know, lie beyond the immediate purview of the scientific. Uh, because of course, you know, in many of these areas, um, facts are, are vital and scientific evidence is vital, but they're never going to be complete uh, answers to, to, to to those problems. So public engagement is a very useful way of tapping into and gathering forms of social intelligence that can help enrich uh, the policy process, even though, you know, at times it can feel messy and slow and, and frustrating. Uh, yes. So thank you very much for a very interesting, thought-provoking talk. I think my, my question uh, inadvertently ties very much into that last question. Um, when you have a, a democratic dialogue, traditionally those would be revolving around different views or different directions that we would want to take policy or, or society in. When you have a dialogue around scientific issues, it seems to me that there are two areas that, that might be inadvertently conflated, one of which is a dialogue around views such as whether it's moral to clone a human being or something of that sort. And then you also have dialogue around the facts. And as the other gentleman was pointing out, we, we do see a lot of either ill-informed dialogue around facts or deliberately misinformed dialogue around facts where you have vested interests in one side or the other. So I guess my question to you is, uh, how should we first of all separate these two forms of dialogue about science and how would we go about it and then how do you deal with a, at least in North America, generally poorly informed uh, debate around scientific facts and sometimes deliberately misinformed debate? Yeah, I mean that's a, a, a great question that goes to the heart of this whole this whole area. I mean, I think the the uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, we need to be conscious of when um, uh, we're moving uh, between those different realms, as you describe. But you know, very often in these kind of controversies, that line of separation is far from clear, and, and you know, indeed, some would argue is is is, is rarely uh, uh, you know possible to to discern and define. Um, so I think the, you know, difficult, I mean, if you take a, a case like climate, you know, wh pointing to the precise point where, where sort of facts end and, and, and values begin is a, a, you know, a very difficult task. Um, we need to make sure that, uh, of course, there are, there are structures and processes in place that allow uh, scientific evidence to feed into the policy process um, that... Uh, uh, illuminate also areas of scientific uncertainty uh, as well as, as broader societal debate. Um, but then around that, you know, once you're moving then into the, into the what are the policy consequences of that, of that science, of what we know about the climate system, uh, the scope and the importance of public values, public concerns is obviously far greater. So uh, I think the fault lies on both sides. For sure, uh, at times we see uh, public voices 
protesters, climate skeptics, voices magnified and reflected through the media, uh, either willfully, as you suggest, or, or, or accidentally uh, stumbling and confusing between these, 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 these different uh, areas. Uh, but also the scientific community itself can often be at fault in attempting too rigidly to pretend that boundaries and lines exist uh, or that unproblematically you can move from uh, a position of scientific consensus, a, a set of uh, established scientific positions to uh, a set of policy prescriptions and priorities, which I think is clearly uh, where uh, the scope for robust uh, and, and at times noisy democratic disagreement uh, arises. Um, I've got one question I'll take off the screen here. You, it says, I briefly touched on the science and technology innovation process that exists in China. Could you provide an example of how the real system is more complex than the process you described? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't got any slides on this, but I, I, um, I've done a couple of studies of, of the science innovation policy system in China, uh, one of which was published uh, in 2007, um, just after... Uh, the Chinese government had put in place its uh, most recent medium to long-term plan for science and, and technology policy, and this runs from, or ran from 2005 to 2020. Uh, and I've updated this recently in a report uh, that came out a few months ago called China's Absorptive State, which looks at uh, uh, more recent developments over the last uh, five or six years in China's uh, science innovation system. Um, and that second report was particularly concerned with what was changing um, uh, in anticipation of and under China's new leadership, which, uh, uh, you know, after the transition to uh, President Xi uh, um, just over a year ago. Um, and I think, you know, when you, when you sort of study and explore processes of science policymaking in China, uh, the contrast between the sort of mythical account that you sometimes read uh, in the West of, of, as I say, a very uh, um, tightly controlled and determined process with little debate, um, you know, doesn't really match up to, to, to what you see in practice. Uh, I mean, in preparation for the production of, of, of their medium to long term plan, uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese government, the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Chinese Academy of Science, uh, underwent an enormous process of consultation with uh, um, uh, uh, both expert communities and primarily expert communities. Uh, but even there, you also see aspects of public engagement. Uh, in China, there are, uh, there's bodies equivalent to things like the, the, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, within the system. Uh, in that special issue I mentioned of uh, public understanding of science, we have a nice piece by a Chinese um, science policy scholar talking about the, the, I think the title is the, the slow long road to public engagement in science in, in China. Uh, of course, it would be foolish and naive to pretend that uh, uh, there's the kind of depth and quality and freedom to debate uh, these issues that there is in the West. Um, but it's also wrong to uh, uh, um, caricature uh, the Chinese system as not allowing for any uh, discussion and, and debate in, 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 in the way it uh, arrives at um, priorities for policy, priorities for investment in science. Um, uh, there's a lot more going on beneath the surface, um, which I'm sure others who are here who've spent time in China would, would, would agree with. Yes. Good evening. I'd, I'd like to thank you for opening this Pandora's box. I think it's been a, a very valuable discussion. I particularly uh, appreciated the concepts of the complexity of science today um, and conflating that with policy making uh, democratically driven. Uh, one particular aspect of it that concerns me living in what is increasingly becoming a sound bite world um, framed by capitalism is the difficulty in um, perceiving that which is valid science and that which is junk science. Because I've seen examples of both. And where the public is not, um, not expected to be, I mean, we certainly aren't at a level of understanding some of the complexities that are necessary in the decision making. How does one work one's way through uh, profit levels for companies that have 
scientists on hire through uh, scientific institutions such as the one at Sussex, through um, policy making that is driven by uh, non-scientists. How do you see that um, working together with, with, uh, with innovative and responsible uh, science research? Well, of course, those are those are you know difficult challenges, as as I've as I've said uh, in, in in my talk. Um, the the point I'm trying to make is that um, you know trying to sort of shut out public views, uh, trying to sort of prevent public engagement, isn't necessarily going to result in a in a in a better, more res more robust, or indeed more innovative system. It might take you down a different path. Uh, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Um, and that's something, as I say, we need to sort of resist and push back at in uh, science and innovation policy, as in most areas of policy, sort of linear narratives that are uh, uh, you know, foisted on us from the top that tell us uh, you know, there's no alternative. There's only one direction. Uh, as I say, in the context of globalization of science, we're in some uh, uh, race to the finish with China or India or Brazil or whichever other emerging economy is, is uh, uh, in the news at the moment. Uh, and that if we sort of pause and take breath uh, and allow this kind of broader discussion, that's somehow going to knock us off track and, and push us to the, to the back of the pack. Uh, you know, I think that's simply not, not the case. Um, and as I say, if you go back to the uh, emergence of modern science uh, and the kind of account that I was summarizing from someone like Sheila Jasnoff about the way in which science uh, and the scientific method emerged sort of hand in hand with the, 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 the rise of, of democracy uh, during the Enlightenment, um, the uh, alignment of these different things was far more uh, 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 you know, obvious and, 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 and easy to see. Uh, these days it's more complicated, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, democracy, as it applies to science and, and technology policy, the governance of science and technology, is now somehow in opposition uh, uh, to scientific progress. Um, it, it just may force us to ask difficult questions about the choices that attach themselves to science and technology, just as they attach themselves to every other uh, area of, of, of uh, uh, policy and life. You. Um, you talked about uh, how um, science is sort of trying to look to democracy to uh, get different perspectives. Um, and we've also talked about how some of them are a bit noisier than others. Um, but some of them, uh, but there also seems to be that there are in, in democracies that there are important perspectives that aren't heard from because they're simply not democratically uh, engaged uh, or active. And so, um, and yet these are perspectives that are, uh, we might really want to hear from. And so how, uh, to what extent is this a problem for science policy and uh, what can be done to remedy that? Sort of perspectives we, we meaning that were... Well, I'm just talking about different different uh, parts of the population that don't vote, um, and yet these are, you know, presumably these are people who, for you know, different reasons, uh, different scientific uh, uh, decisions can can affect their lives dramatically. So, uh, what can be done to get their input if they're simply not engaged? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's a particular problem. For, for science policy, so much as a, as a broader problem of, of political disengagement, uh, uh, and sh it's certainly true that uh, if you have, uh, as you do in, in uh, uh, most um, advanced democracies, a, a sizable chunk of the population who, who don't vote uh, uh, in elections and don't participate, I don't know what the turnout figures will be uh, for today's uh, European elections in the UK, but they're usually uh, pretty dismal. They might be slightly higher this this time because of uh, 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 a more visible debate. Um, but if you have people who are disengaged from politics more generally, they're, they're, you're quite right. They're not likely to be wanting to engage in uh, 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 you know detailed debates about the uh, the governance of uh, 
synthetic biology or, or, or geoengineering. Um, so I think, again, I mean, you know, one thing you can do is try through these kind of experiments that I've described of, you know, different forms of public engagement to uh, try with sort of micro-publics in a way to tap into uh, uh, the mix of, of uh, uh, values, concerns, opinions that you might find um, replicated on a larger scale elsewhere among a, among a particular population. Um, and then on the other side, there's obviously a huge amount to do, which I haven't really talked about in this talk, in terms of, of uh, you know, broader scientific education, um, uh, seeking to engage uh, uh, a bigger swathe of the population in discussions about science. Um, and I don't think these kind of debates about science, uh, about public engagement, stand uh, necessarily in opposition to uh, any of those sorts of efforts to uh, popularise science uh, and communicate science um, through the media, through TV programmes and other means. Um, uh, there can at times be a rather tense relationship between uh, people who talk about public engagement in science and others who see uh, the communication of science as, as the priority. Um, but I think there's plenty of room for uh, both and plenty more of both uh, in most systems, including uh, uh, the UK and probably uh, here in Canada. This is one of the things, as I say, we've been looking at in this report that's coming out um, in a couple of months from the Council of Canadian Academies on uh, uh, Canada's science culture. Great. Thanks very much. A few quick comments before we adjourn, if you could just wait for one moment. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, James Wilsden, for your lecture this evening. Uh, you offered a formula of policies to encourage good governance of science, uh, support for public dialogue, support for the responsible research and innovation agenda, support for the role of scientific advisors, uh, and the promotion of open access publishing. Um, all of this in the context of uh, democratic systems which, while they make mistakes, um, offer the seemingly the best effective uh, route to, uh, uh, to grope their way towards good, good policy solutions. I hope that in the uh, true spirit of science, your theories are given uh, plenty of opportunity to be tested in the laboratory of, of real life. And for traveling all the way to uh, Waterloo, your first time in Waterloo, if not your first in Canada, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the audience and, and CG, thank you very much. Our next public event in the auditorium on Thursday, May 29th, former Canadian Ambassador Joseph Karen will be here describing some of the factors that have shaped Asia's past and will certainly shape its future. Also, CG invites you to a very special lunchtime presentation, a conversation with Mohammed Yunus, winner of the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. He's a Bangladeshi social entrepreneur and banker who pioneered the concepts of microcredit and microfinance. That event takes place on Monday, June 2nd. Registered attendees will receive a free complimentary lunch at noon, followed by Yunus's lecture at 1 p.m. And on June 4th, the CG Cinema series resumes with an evening screening of The Square. That is a documentary following the journey of several revolutionary leaders through the recent uh, Egyptian revolution. So reserve your seats for these events through our website. Be sure to subscribe to our events newsletter. And thank you again for coming to CG this evening. Have a safe journey home. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, will, will have read this um, provocative cover essay in The Economist a few weeks ago. It came out in, in March, which took recent events in Ukraine uh, as the prompt for a lament about the prospects for democracy worldwide. Uh, and as The Economist argues in that piece, uh, the quote there, democracy is going through a difficult time uh, where autocrats have been driven out of office their opponents have mostly failed to create viable democratic regimes. Even in established democracies, flaws in the system have become worryingly visible and disillusion with politics is rife. Yet just a few years ago, democracy looked uh, as though it would dominate the world. Uh, and the Economist piece mentions work by the U uh, US think tank Freedom House, which uh, in the year 2000 classified 120 countries uh, as democracy. They now, however, suggest that 2013 was the eighth consecutive year 
in which global freedom on various indices has declined. Uh, and as we've seen in various different ways in Cairo, in Crimea, uh, or in South Sudan, faith in democracy flares up in moments of triumph and transition uh, only to collapse again all too quickly. Linked to the argument in that economist piece, I want to mention this book, uh, which came out a few months ago, uh, written by uh, a guy called David Runciman, who's professor of politics uh, at Cambridge uh, in the UK. Um, and it, it's a great book. It makes one of the best um, attempts, I've read at least, to grapple with the dilemmas of contemporary democracy. Um, he starts his book, The Confidence Trap, by telling two competing stories about democracy. Which I recommend that you take a look at. On third, uh, and tonight, he will be ex uh, giving this lecture on science, technology, and experiments in democracy, which will explore opportunities, tensions, and dilemmas in the democratic governance of science and technology. Please welcome James Wilson. Great. Well, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Fred, for that uh, introduction. And uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've heard a lot about uh, CG over the last few years. Um, uh, so it's a real pleasure to have an opportunity to come and, uh, uh, and see where it all happens. Um, as Heather says, um, I'm here as part of a bigger group, many of whom are here in the audience, uh, who've been looking uh, over the last couple of days and tomorrow uh, at science policy interactions in Canada, the US, uh, and the UK. Uh, and throughout our discussions, we've been considering uh, democracy uh, as a crucial, if at times complicated, part uh, of that mix. And this evening, um, given that polls have just in the last few hours closed um, on the first day of the European Parliament elections back uh, uh, at home for me, uh, I thought I'd widen that lens a little further to uh, explore with you the relationship between science and democracy in Europe. Uh, and I want to start with two contrasting faces of European democracy. <laughs> One on the left is Conchita Verst, the Austrian chanteuse who won the heart of millions when she stormed to victory two weeks ago in the Eurovision. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing uh, support of the CG Signature Lecture Series, and also tonight's co-sponsor, the Balsley School of International Affairs, for their support. Thanks also to those joining us from around the world through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, uh, we welcome questions from both audiences here in the CG Auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. In this era of technology, discovery and innovation, the role of science and scientists has never been more important. And so the demand for scientific advice is growing. Questions are put to scientists from policymakers, the media and the public on issues ranging from climate change to cybersecurity, from poverty to pandemics. But the experts themselves are also coming under a microscope from wider society, leading to tensions and dilemmas in the governance of science. To address these issues tonight, we have Dr. James Wilsden. And to more properly introduce Professor Wilsden, I'd now like to call on Heather Douglas, the Waterloo Chair in Science and Society in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Waterloo. So uh, first I'd like to thank CG for uh, sponsoring this public lecture this evening, um, as well as the Balsley School for helping to sponsor the workshop that's conjoined with it, the Science Policy Interface International Comparisons, taking over the last today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow at the Balsley School, which has been funded both by the Balsley School, the University of Waterloo, and the Social, Social, Science, uh, uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, but uh, my great pleasure is actually to introduce James Wilsden uh, for this evening's lecture. Professor Wilsden is currently Professor of Science and Democracy at the Science and Technology Policy Research Center, which is also famously known as SPRU, at the University of Sussex. Prior to joining SPRU, 
He was director of the Science Policy Center of the Royal Society from 2008 to 2011. And he also worked at the Think Tank Demos from 2001 to 2008, first as head of strategy and then as head of science and innovation. He earned his PhD at Middlesex University in 2004 and has subsequently published widely on science policy issues in both the UK and in other countries, particularly in Asia. He has published numerous articles and reports, including co-editing the 2013 Future Directions for Scientific Advice in Whitehall. He is a member of the expert panel convened for the Council of Canadian Academies forthcoming report on the state of, science, state of Canada's science culture. And he is co-founder and editor of The Guardian's blog on science policy. ...and song contest with her Shirley Bassey-style anthem, Rise Like a Phoenix. Um, the other... Uh, it's fairly obvious who, is Nigel Farage, uh, leader of the far-right UK Independence Party, uh, who most pollsters predict will have won the largest share of the public vote uh, in the UK today in, in, in the European elections. One represents creativity, experimentation and diversity. Uh, Conchita is in many ways an ambassador for a progressive cosmopolitan vision of Europe. The other represents xenophobia, cultural pessimism uh, and the politics of fear, a retreat back into a little Englander view of the world that had precious little to offer us uh, in the 1950s and even less today. And at a time when uh, the project of um, European integration has been stalling in the aftermath of the financial crisis, when we see the rise of populist extremist voices in many member states, uh, and when there's a crisis of confidence in democracy, not only in Europe, uh, but arguably worldwide, um, I want, in, in my remarks this evening, to mount a defence, uh, however unfashionable, uh, of democratic engagement and deliberation as, as an imperfect but vital uh, and, I think, consistently undervalued asset uh, of European science and innovation. And I hope that the arguments I make, um, while rooted in the European context, has, have resonance uh, and relevance to the Canadian context too. What's gone wrong with democracy is a question we've been hearing a lot recently, 